The other major initiative is project-based learning. Um, last year, all 11th and 12th grade teachers were trained in project-based learning. And really, this came out of our STEM initiative uh, two years ago. Teachers, it was um, we empowered them. We, we let them choose uh, during the STEM committee. And, and one of the things that came out of there was project-based learning. So last year, all 11th and 12th teachers were trained. Uh, this year, 9th and 10th grade teachers were trained the first half of the year. Uh, the second half of the year, all 7th and 8th grade teachers are, going, are being trained. So by the end of this year, 7th through 12th grade teachers will all be trained in project-based learning. Our main focus for 11th and 12th grade teachers and, and 9th and 10th teachers are cross-curricular projects. So we want teachers, as part of their differentiated supervision, we want teachers working with other teachers, obviously across departments, we want teachers going out and, and soliciting an employer, working with that employer, and bringing back some kind of problem that our kids could help that employer solve. Um, so that's our goal this year with our teachers. Go out, find an employer, bring a problem back, let our kids work together, collaborate uh, to solve that problem. We're going to have ongoing professional development with project-based learning. Uh, at May 11th, I believe, in, in service day, uh, the trainers that we had training our staff on project-based learning are coming back for what we're calling a, a third and final day, just kind of a refresher uh, on project-based learning, and that's going to allow our teachers to share some of their struggles and accomplishments and, and work together to, to design uh, additional projects for next school year. Our main focus for our kids to get out of project-based learning, we want them to be, be able to collaborate, critical think, problem solve, and, and be creative. These are the top skills employers are looking for uh, when you do all the research from 2020 and beyond. Uh, right now, we're preparing kids for jobs that don't, do not exist. So we feel kids are, are good, collabor good collaborators, they can critical think, and they can problem solve and be creative, they, they will be successful once they leave us, and ultimately that's our goal. Uh, our current schedule, before we get into the one uh, that we're going to show you tonight, I just want to make sure everybody knows what our current schedule is here at high school. Our kids um, have tutorial time on Tuesday and Thursday mornings from 6.55 to 7.25. So students can come in in the morning on Tuesday and Thursdays uh, for 30 minutes to get help from any teacher that they want. Uh, our periods, we have an eight period day. Now, I know you see period 11 period, but we have our lunches are scheduled in the master schedule. And I want you to note that period four, period six, and period eight, because that's going to come into play uh, when we talk about the new schedule. So kids schedule eight classes. Classes are 42 minutes long. Uh, and, and the student day goes from 7.30 until 2.25. And that tutoring time on Tuesday and Thursdays, which I will tell you, uh, to get a high school student here uh, by 6.55 is uh, a little bit difficult. Okay? That, that time isn't well used or well utilized at, at, at the current time. Okay, some other problems with our, with our current schedule. Uh, the 40, our 42-minute periods are not conducive to deep dives into content. Uh, our focus right now um, with, with the 42 minutes, let's cover as much content as we can. Uh, but our new focus we, with, with longer class periods, we want teachers uh, really focusing on not covering as much content, but covering the content that they are covering deeper. Okay, and that's the goal with project-based learning. Some other issues, scheduling and flexibility. I talked about the three lunches being scheduled into the master schedule. So if a student gets lunch A, lunch A students are blocked from period four, five, and six, seven classes. And if a student is in lunch B, they're blocked from uh, periods five, six, and, and seven, eight classes. So our goal, let's try to increase that scheduling flexibility for all kids. We have every other day, EOD stands for every other day, classes periods two and 10. The reason for this, the science labs run periods two and 10. In science labs, they have a block period every other day. So on one day, period two, they have a double chemistry. The other day, they have chemistry period one and they're open period two. So we have to run some kind of elective to offset uh, all the science labs. So we have electives that are every other day and we have semester electives. Uh, we have very little time for advisory, remediation, enrichment, and genius hour. Uh, genius hour is also known as Google time. Google gives its employees 20% of their time to pretty much explore and do whatever they want. And what the research has shown, 50% of Google's top products come out of that Google time. So Gmail is one of the products that have come out that has come out of, of the Google time. So what Google's noticing, you give give employees the freedom and, and empower them, 
Uh, they're coming up with some great ideas and, and innovative ideas. Currently, our EWCTC students have very little time to see teachers outside of class. Uh, our teachers have very little time for, for collaboration, and our students have to focus on eight classes a day. And I'm going to let Mr. Cullen talk about this. He did a nice job explaining this at the teacher leader meeting. So, Jeff? Yeah, a little earlier, Mr. Mann showed you the schedule that we have, the eight period day. We start at 6.55. And you know, ideally, it's great to have students come in for tutoring at 6.55. And we tell students that are there in need of remediation, come on in for tutoring. Um, 6.55 early morning, it's dark here, okay, for most of the year. Um, for students that come in, uh, especially when you're talking about freshmen and sophomores, perhaps going to the car, or students are working late, or we have athletic events, and we look at the game we have tonight, our student athletes are going to be here, our student body, our cheerleaders. We're going to have students here until after 10 o'clock, okay, with the, uh, perhaps, on the evening. And we're traveling away later than that. So to come in at 6.55, that's tough. Um, and our students that go through an eight period day, that's eight classes, that's potentially eight homework assignments, potentially. Um, they're very busy. So when we went and looked at other schools, we saw schools uh, with this alternative schedule, a schedule that was a break away from what schedules were in the 1970s, um, the 80s, the 90s, this alternative schedule, and it was refreshing. Uh, it seemed as if it was a, an environment where students were more relaxed, where it was a little less stress, and where students could, uh, as we talked about, taking deeper dives into the curriculum. So that, our eight period day, you know, we get used to it. Okay, we're used to it because that's all we know. But truthfully, you know, we talked to our faculty about it. Uh, for our students, for our students' perspective, you know, moving eight classes a day, um, in between classes with that bell change, it's a rat race for it. And it's a rat race for our faculty as well. It's a tough day. Uh, I think in looking at the other schools with this alternative schedule, there might be a better way to do this. And that's what we're presenting to you tonight. And that's what we're uh, explaining for you. So um, we're going to continue on with the presentation here. Our goals, when we set out and really started looking at different schedules, uh, the goals and objectives that we had, number one, create longer class periods for PBL, because we want, like we said, we want kids deeper diving, we want them reflecting, we want them collaborating, and we want to engage in a meaningful ways with, with problems. We wanted to create time for teachers to collaborate and improve instruct, which will improve instruction for all students. We wanted to create time for students to gain remediation, intervention, and enrichment during the course of the day. Because like I said, that, that tutorial time, 6.55, uh, it's too early for students, they are not taking advantage of that time. So we want to we create time in, in the schedule where kids can, can have full access to teachers uh, during the course of the day when they are all here. Our goal was to, is to reduce and eliminate study halls. Uh, the feedback from staff, students are not utilizing study halls to, for what they were, were meant to be utilized for. Our goal also is to reduce daily transitions. The transitions are, is the time in between class periods, or the number of times kids switch classes. Um, we want to create an efficient and effective way of scheduling students with a focus on maximizing our opportunities. We want students, when they select courses, we want every, every kid to get every class they select. That's our goal. And we don't want to have to tell a kid there's a conflict, you can't get this class, we, you have to choose something else. Our goal going is, going into this schedule, every kid gets every class that they schedule. And we're always looking, always, we always feel the school culture and climate can, can be improved. So that's something we're, we're always focusing on, how we can improve school call, culture and climate. So the different schools that we visited, and I have to, have to thank that all the teachers uh, that went on these school visits, time out of their class, time away from their families. Uh, so we're very appreciative, and we have five of those teachers here tonight that, that we'll talk to in a minute. Uh, we're thankful that they were able to come with us uh, to study these to study these schedules. Uh, their input has been invaluable uh, to help us kind of fine tune uh, what we found to like. The schools we visited: Greensburg, Salem, Kiskey area. Both those schools are on a traditional, or Greensburg, Salem's on a traditional block schedule. Kiskey's on a modified block. Salterton is on a, a different type of modified block. Uh, Downingtown, same thing. Uh, but with Downingtown, they have, it's a block, then on the second day, they have a full eight period day. Uh, Avon Grove, um, Lower Mary, both schools are out east, very similar type schedules, uh, which we're going to, you'll see here in a minute. Uh, and Fox Chapel, we did a phone conference with Fox Chapel. They are also on a modified uh, hybrid type block schedule. So the schedule that we found that we love is the Lower Marion schedule. 
Okay, first of all, this is not a block schedule. Okay, this is what we call a rotating drop to or a cascading drop to schedule. And I have handouts. Of I know it's probably a little bit easier. I don't have this one separate. Give me a second to check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, first of all, Lower Marion has been using this schedule for the past 10 years. Okay, and I know you see Lunch and Learn in the middle. Don't focus on Lunch and Learn quite yet. We are going to be talking about Lunch and Learn. But let's just focus on getting you to understand uh, the Bell schedule. Kids will still schedule eight periods just like they do now. Okay, once again, kids still schedule eight periods just like they do now. Every day, if you can look, it's a four-day rotating schedule. So on day A, students are only going to have six of those eight classes. So two of the classes drop. On day A, it's periods or it sets four and eight. Okay, on day B, it sets one and five. Okay. The other thing to notice if I can get the laser, if you look at set one, we're no longer calling them periods because the sets are going to rotate through the different period times throughout the morning, then throughout the afternoon. So if you look at day A, set one, okay, that class is from 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning. On day B, they don't have set one. On day C, set one is now during period three. On day D, set one is now during period two. So think of the, there's four periods in the morning that cartwheel, and there's four periods in the afternoon that cartwheel. Okay. That's why it's called the rotating drop two. There's two periods that drop out every day. So kids don't always have period one during the set one during the period one time frame. Talking with the principals, students, and teachers at the local schools and at Lower Marion, that's one thing that they really like. That the, that the it's, first of all, it's not Groundhog Day. And students that are tardy, they're not always missing the same period every day. Students that leave early for sports are not always missing the same period. Okay, so that's why that was one of the main positives of the rotating schedule. Now, you can't rotate all eight periods because of EWCTC, our morning tech and afternoon tech. That's why we cartwheel the morning, and that's why we cartwheel the afternoon. Okay, now. Since students are dropping, we're dropping two periods a day, the, the periods now go from 42 minutes to 55 minutes. So we're accomplishing one of our goals by extending the class time from 42 to 55. Teachers will see, the, most teachers will see their kids three out of four days. Okay, if you think about college, your college classes, you do not have college every single day. You're usually scheduling classes on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or classes on Tuesday, Thursday. So this schedule, yes, they're still going to have some classes back to back. But there's going to be days where, it's going to, where they're going to have math on Wednesday. They're not going to have math on, on Thursday. They won't have math again until Friday. So that's starting to prepare them for college for a college schedule. The only, the only courses that will see their classes every day, first of all, algebra. Algebra is a keystone tested subject. So we're looking at having running algebra. Those teachers, as algebra teachers, would see their kids four out of four days. The other, other algebra, or the other keystone tested subject area, biology. Biology, we want, to, want those teachers to see the kids four out of four days. Now, if you think of our current science lab, let's use chemistry for an example. Our chemistry teachers see their kids, let's say on day A, for 84 minutes, it's a block period. On day B, it's 42 minutes. But that just, that rotates the whole way through. So it's 84, 42, 84, 42. Talking with the chemistry teachers, they would like to see their see the kids three out of four days, but one of those days they want to block, so they so they have time to do their lab experiments. So one out of four, the chemistry teachers would see their kids for 110 minutes, and that's the day they would go through and do all their labs. Okay, the other two days would be 55 minutes. Any questions? Now that's a little bit confusing to understand. John, yes. How, how, without getting into too much detail, how would you do the 
let's take the algebra, then they have to not have another class. What, if you think about algebra, most kids in ninth grade are taking algebra. All kids in ninth grade are taking biology. So we're looking at matching up that extra day pick tone with the bio. So that there would be two days, maybe those kids are going to a study hall, or what Lower Mary does, they, those kids go into a, a gym class. So those kids would only be actually getting five classes a day then because of that doubling up? You can't really think about it. You have to sit down and map out a kid's schedule. So yes, maybe on that day, yes, they're getting five, correct. <coughs> The other thing, when you look at a teacher's schedule, every single day the teacher would get their planning period, okay, which is by in their contract they have a planning period. Two out of the four days they have two open periods. Okay? The other two days they only have one open period. On the days that they have two open periods, we, one of the other goals uh, when we sit out to look at schedules, increase teacher collaboration. So one out of four days with that extra open period, we want, we're, our goal is to get the entire, I'm going to use math, get the entire math department off that period to collaborate. Okay, the other day the teacher has two open periods would be some kind of duty. Okay, so just make sure you understand that every day the teacher, every day the teacher has a planning period. Two out of those four days, they have two open periods. One of those open periods, we're looking one, one out of the four days to um, get the entire department off together for them to collaborate. Questions on the schedule before I turn it over to these fantastic <coughs> teachers that are going to talk to you about lunch and learn. Good. Okay, with us tonight we have Jason Brandt from the from the science department, Megan Proker from science, Laura Smith from moral language, Susan Kuhn, one of our counselors, and Cindy Pompilia, who's our calculus teacher. Um, and Jackie Hughes also went to Laura Mary with us, but she couldn't be here this evening. Um, and once again, I have to thank these five. We, we left very early on a Thursday morning, went to Adam Grove in the morning, um, checked into a hotel, then went to uh, Lower Mary the next morning, and to Salerton. Uh, so we squeezed a lot of school visits and a lot of quality van time uh, <laughs> together, um, which led to a lot of quality discussion on the way home to really talk and reflect on the different schedules that we saw. So I'm going to turn it over to them to let you kind of share their thoughts and what they got to see and also talk about lunch and learn. Well, I think one of the biggest things that we really like with lunch and learn is it gives students responsibility for whatever they're going to do. If a kid needs to get help, it's their responsibility to do that. Um, we talk to kids who just need to decompress. Well, if you need to do that, you're going to decompress. If you need to get out and get some physical activity, then you're able to do that. So it enables a freedom for the student to make their own choices within a structure. And when you look at what you go off to at college, where you're given all this new free time, you have to learn how to balance. We feel this is a good way to kind of get that student that taste of freedom and managing their own time. Just to, sorry, just, just to go along with what Jason was saying, um, I think that as a student, having this one hour during the day where your time is yours and it's flexible and you can use it as you see best. Our students are so used to a rigid schedule. You have to be here at this time. You have to do this. You stay here until this time. Then the bell rings and then everybody moves at one time to another location. I think that this one hour in the middle of the day, they have so many choices and they can choose what they feel is best for them, them that particular day. They can do something different every day, but they can go see teachers if they need help or if they want enrichment. Um, at Lower Mary, they had the gym open so kids were playing basketball, if they needed to blow off some steam that way. Uh, I think it was the first Friday maybe every month, they had an open mic night in one of the classrooms. and. We went in to observe that and there was a student up front with his guitar and a student standing beside him singing and there was an audience there um, listening to them. So I think, I think as a student, uh, I think this would be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would set it back up a little bit because we're so familiar with it that I'm not sure you understand yeah. the mechanics and how that may be. <laughs> uh, and the way it is, is there is, a, is it an hour or 65 minutes? 65 minutes? 65 minutes built into the middle of the day after between third period and then the afternoon schedule. 
and then during that 65 minutes, the students are expected to eat at some point. Uh, they can either eat their, their, at the beginning or the middle or the end. And then the other rest of the, the rest of that time, the students are free to choose what they, they want to do. Um, so if this, uh, the students they can go to the cafeteria at first, and then they can eat wherever they want in the building. They can choose to sit in the cafeteria. Although our observation in the two schools that we saw doing this, that the cafeteria was pretty empty. Um, that the, the students just really weren't choosing to eat there. There were students eating in the hallways. Uh, students eat outside in collaboration centers and teachers' rooms, um, wherever they felt comfortable eating. And they can eat at any point during that 65 minute period that they want to. Then the other, uh, the rest of that time is when they were doing the stuff that Megan and Jason were talking about with, uh, they could go to a teacher for remediation, they can just <coughs> sit in the hallway with their uh, ear, earphones in and just listening to music, they can be outside. Uh, they can be in the gym, they can be doing activities like music, whatever they feel like doing, um, making up work and, and doing whatever. From the teacher end of it, uh, we, if I have this right, we would, or correct, we would be assigned either the first half of that 65 minute period or the second half would be our lunch time. And if we choose to, you know, just sit in our room or go to the faculty dining area and just have that alone time, we're, that's, we're allowed to do that. And then that other half, we're, uh, we would be available if students do need remediation or need to make up a test, or if, if they want to do an athletes club, <laughs> you know, they can come and, you know, um, it is, yeah, it's a club. <laughs> anyway, no, if they want to, do, certain more seriously, if they want to do uh, a, some sort of activity that they're interested in, they can do that. And it, it's not a time when teachers are on parole or, or, or checking to make sure kids you know, are, are, are behaving. It's just an opportunity uh, for the students to engage and develop relationships with the teachers um, and, and just to uh, give the students a responsibility to do what they need to do or want to do during that time frame. And I thought what was interesting about the way the teachers were scheduled with their lunch, they gave a kid have to sit there and say, okay, Mrs. Pompali eats her lunch during that first section, so I need to eat my lunch during that today because I really need to see her in the second one. And when you go to college, you have to do that and see when office hours are and plan accordingly. If you're on a job and you need to collaborate with somebody based on the tasks they're doing. So I thought it gave some real world experience in that amount of time with us still here to help them. And, then, and if, before we go on with like our thoughts about it, do you understand how the mechanics work or are there any questions on it? You can see the slide that's being displayed right now. So for one hour daily, no classes are being held at the high school. All students and faculty eat lunch during this hour. All faculty, counselors, and staff are available to students for at least 30 minutes of what we're going to call learn time during this hour. Students grades 10 through 12, and, and Chad will talk about grade 9 here in a couple minutes, Students grade 10 through 12 earn the right to choose options during this time, and intervention time is structured for, for some students. And they mentioned it, one of Kiski Area High School, we implemented a bunch of for this year. We went, went out and visited Kiski. A couple of things that we saw there, our teachers ran a watercolor workshop. So any student that was interest, interested in going to a watercolor workshop could sign up and go work with that teacher during that time for some enrichment. Uh, their PE department ran intramurals during that time. So if a student's in good standing, discipline, attendance, grades, they have that time's theirs, and we'll explain that right down here in a couple minutes. I also think touching on like the vision for the next five years and always looking to improve the culture and climate of the school. Um, when we went to Lower Marion, just the culture of the school there and the atmosphere, it was so impressive. I could have spent the whole day there. Um, it was like, I wish I could send my kids to a school like that. I have two young children, and I refuse to leave the school district. I want to make sure they go here, but I want to make sure they have the best opportunities also. Um, and we got to sit down and talk to some high school students there about their experience. And they just, they loved their school and they loved being there and all the opportunities that they had at that school. And it was just so impressive to see them wanting to come to school. Because you think of the students that are here and you know it's a struggle for them every day. They don't have a place. They don't feel like they have time to be in clubs or to be involved in things because they can't get here early enough. They have to leave right after school. Um, you know, they don't have that time to make connections with, with other teachers or students. So this really gives an opportunity for so many things um, for the students to get involved in and just really make it a great experience for them in high school. So 
And what we believe would be appropriate for our freshmen is for all of them to continue to eat together as they do now. Okay? So freshmen would have their lunch and a freshman lunch. It would not be an open lunch where 10th and 12th, 10th and 12th grade uh, would be able to eat um, at a time that they desire. Freshmen will have a set lunch together. They will also, at the conclusion of that lunch, report back to an advisor. Okay? And that's key because we really want to work with them academically on getting them off to the right start in high school. So all of them will have 30 minutes daily for intervention, remediation, or enrichment. Uh, they also, some of the things that we talked about this year and we shared with you, uh, we feel strongly about career pathways. And we feel that with our freshmen, that's really key. And we talked about scheduling options and working with freshmen. Um, a lot of things that we are doing with freshmen uh, in terms of what we hope and our vision, we think that this time, this 30 minutes in the middle of the day, where they, we have them, we can work with them on career-related interests and helping them with scheduling through our guidance department, um, through bringing in career guest speakers, uh, bringing in people from the field, bringing in an electrician to talk to them for 30 minutes in the auditorium, bringing in uh, someone, an engineer to come in and talk to them, or someone in the medical field to talk to our freshmen. That 30 minutes is a nice chunk of time to have with them and we can do that. Um, we talked about our link crew, our peer mentorship we, we brought along. It's a great opportunity for our link crew to reach out to our freshmen as well and assist them. So um, all of our ninth grade students will have access to their teachers, okay, during that period. Um, they have that opportunity for, uh, if they need to use it, they can come work with the silent study hall or for some downtime as well. So it's just going to be more structured for our freshmen, okay? Um, four years, okay, uh, you're thinking of the age 14 through 18, that's only four years. It might not be a whole lot different for you and I, okay, a four-year span. But when you talk about growth and maturity, that is a big gap, and we recognize that, and we feel uh, certainly a responsibility to give a little bit more structure for our freshmen during the watch time. Some advantages, and I'm not going to read every single one, I'm just going to focus uh, number three, commitment to this time in the middle of the day will increase participation and give students opportunity, opportunity to get enrichment, remediation, and, and some kind of intervention, or the opportunity to participate in clubs uh, or some intramurals or, or some genius hour type activities. Um, students are empowered and earn choice. Uh, we had a great uh, in-service day yesterday talking about building relationships, empowering students, uh, and giving them voice and choice uh, in their learning. Um, and finally, all hands on deck, all staff members are available uh, to support with, with us giving them no meetings. All principals are available um, to kind of manage um, the lunch and learn. And, and some challenges that we recognize, and, and the teachers have been great helping us uh, recognize some challenges and, and also providing solutions to the challenges. Um, number one is just managing that unstructured time. Uh, commitment. We want the, the commitment from the students to respect our school facility. We want to keep this building clean. Uh, I think if you walk through here on any given day, it's, it's, a, it's a really clean building. We want to keep it that way. Um, we've got to really look at revising and, and reconsidering some of our emergency procedures. Um, and we're going to really monitor traffic and, and food flow, which basically I think the students will really help us with this. If a student goes to the cafeteria and there's a line for food, they'll, they'll go somewhere else and come back. Um, so really. Uh, relying on the students to kind of to, to monitor that for us. We're excited about this schedule. I, we think it provides students a lot of different opportunities, teachers a lot of different opportunities, and, and administrators a lot of different opportunities. Uh, and like I said, we're, we're ready. We, we want to implement this for next school year um, and with the help of the teachers and, and the, really the help of the other schools. Uh, and I can't thank them enough. They, they set up when we when we went to their teachers' kids um, that we were able to talk to, and that's that's helped us tremendously. Questions? That, yeah, Mr. Laser. Well, you already answered one. I I just want to thank you. I, I see a lot of positive things. And, uh, I hope it works. And we'll support you all we can. We appreciate that, and we know that it's going to be it's going to be messy the first year. It's going to be a work in progress, uh, and maybe after the first year, there's going to be some tweaks that we're going to have to do to fine tune it. I, I think we all uh, recognize that, recognize it, acknowledge it, and we're going to have a great schedule here in a year or two. And the only thing that scared me when you first started talking you said about how the kids can eat anywhere. You know? I thought, well, that sounds good, but then you answered it whenever you said about 
policing it and making right. it more <coughs> Yeah, that's my thought. I thought, oh, damn, these guys are going to be setting them all in the cross block. <laughs> yeah, and, and we do some of that now. A lot of kids in our lunch feed, they're eating in our commons area, they're sitting on the floor, they're eating in the courtyard, and, and for the most part, they're, they're keeping the building clean. Yeah, I'm, I'm jealous. I wish that <laughs> something like this back in the 50s. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Your Honor, will this require any more staff? No. Now, I know you're probably thinking about the algebra. Uh, with, when, when you look at the algebra teachers, the teachers that are teaching algebra, since the lab's associated, they'll be able to teach. Uh, they're going to have two open periods every day. Because if we didn't do it that way, they would only end up with one open period every day. So it's going to make the numbers a little bit tighter in the math department. I'm um, worried about the science with the 110 period, 110 minute period. No, that's that's not going to have. They're going to still. If you think about a science lab teacher now, they can really teach four sections of the class. Right. So it's going to stay the same. So still even with 110 minutes. Yes. Yep. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Thank you, teachers. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. I'd just like to make a comment that um, as much as this was a report here, and it seems very succinct, and I think um, it's very inclusive, um, there has been quite a bit of time um, spent by all of these people as well as other um, staff members researching this. You saw the list of visits. This has been going on for um, more than six months, yes. and um, I appreciate all the time. Um, you know, John mentions the fact that next year it's going to be nesting, and, and we recognize that. Um, but I, I think the amount of work and time that has gone into the planning to this point is really um, instrumental, and it talks to the, um, the idea of the vision of the high school. So um, I appreciate the chat and John and all the teachers and all of the visits. And, and I also think it's money well spent sending them to those places mm -hmm. because if we don't do our due diligence on this. Um, and then shame on us. So I commend you for your willingness to take all that time. And I realize there's a cost, but I, I personally think it's well worth it. We appreciate that. Judy and George and Mike have been very supportive of letting us go out and and, go and, and actually encourage us to go, to go see what other schools have. And really, when we're at these schools, it's some of the best professional development. I think these teachers yeah. say. I was going to say, an added bonus, which we were anticipating, is that we were able to pick up lesson plans and teaching strategies, which had nothing to do with scheduling. Uh, but just getting to uh, collaborate with other teachers in different districts was invaluable for us. Thank you for letting us have the opportunity to go to the school. Thank you.
Uh, Rob Rolick and Matt Horner from Horner Platform and Terry. Uh, and they're here to present the local water report for the year ending June 30th, 2017. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, do you have copies of the report? Yes, sir. Oh, I have nice. copies, and they're also attached electronically to the, uh, the agenda. Okay, so pages three and four of the report is the independent auditor's report. And this outlines your responsibility for the audit versus our responsibility. And our responsibility is essentially to um, determine whether the financial statements are in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. This is an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion. Um, so that's the best that you can get. On page four, there's a, there's a highlight regarding a change in accounting principle. Um, you implemented um, generally accepted accounting, or I'm sorry, government accounting standards board statement number 75, which meant that this year you had to include the liability for post-employment benefits in on your balance sheet. So, so that caused a, a big change, which I'll get to in a second. Now, pages. 6 through 14 is the management's discussion and analysis. And this is a layman's term um, management prepared document. Um, Dan prepares this and, and we review it just to make sure that everything agrees with the rest of the financial statement. Um, so it gives a nice overview of, of the changes in the year, compares it to the prior year. So um, it's, it's good reading material for you. Uh, page 15 is your statement of financial position. And this is your, um, this is your um, full accrual basis financial statement. It, it is designed to be comparable to for-profit entities. So you can see in the bottom your total net position the $29 million negative net position, that really comes from your long-term liabilities being on your financial statements. You can see halfway down there you have your pension liability and your unfunded other post-employment benefits. Those come out to almost $98 million. So you can see if we didn't have to put those on there, it wouldn't, you wouldn't have such a large negative. Uh, if you look at page 16, this is your statement of activity. So this is essentially your income statement on that full accrual basis. And you have, you have a decrease of in, in that position of one million. Essentially that's gonna be your pension and your um, post-employment benefits. On page 17 is uh, what you're accustomed to seeing. This is one of the main reports that goes to the state every year. You can see that you have um, a, a $26 million fund balance there. And, um, and you can see that $20 million of that is in your capital project fund. So that is directly related to, to your bond issuance at this point. <coughs> On page 19 is your, um, is your statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund balance. And you have a $17 million increase in your governmental funds, but you can see that $15 million of that is in capital projects. So that's obviously the bond issuances and such. In the general fund, there was a, a $912,000 increase, but that was because $787,000 was reimbursed following the bond issue for all of the preliminary costs that the general fund had covered in planning the elementary school. If you go back to um, page 46, page 46, you can see your changes in long-term liabilities. You can see that your um, that you had the $19 million bond issuance. So that is going. That really makes up what your increase in bond balance is on that on on your governmental funds. And if you go back to page 68, this is your supplemental reports for your single audit. 
because you spend over $750,000 in federal funds, you have to have a single audit. So on page 774, you actually expended $2.1 million in federal funds. And um, on page 76, this gives a summary of, of, our, of our single audit results. And um, it indicates that you have an unmodified opinion on your financial statements. You had no significant deficiencies in um, internal control and no non-compliance reported at the financial statement level. The, on the single audit level, on the federal financial awards, you, you had no significant deficiencies in internal control. We reported no non-compliance with, with federal funds. So, so this is, your, your audit is really as clean as it can be. Are there any questions from Barb? I shared a little bit of this with the Finance Committee prior to, to this meeting. Um, if there are any questions like this, you have to answer them now. Um, that's a lot to digest. So if you have questions between now and next week, don't hesitate to reach out to me, and I'll pass along the bar to get uh, feedback through. Right, and our contact information is on there. We're always we always welcome calls. If if you have any questions, please just let us know. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank sure. You. Thank you. Okay, um, the next item that we have is the to approve the Act 1 resolution to we'll ask the uh, board to approve uh, the Act 1 resolution not to raise taxes above the index. Just a quick reminder, the index is 3.1%. Uh, that equated to about a two and a half mil increase for the regular Church School District, which means that would be the cap. Um, we've done a preliminary review of the uh, finances and we believe that um, we, can, we will be able to operate from that index. So my recommendation to the full board would be to move forward and adopt the resolution uh, in next week's meeting. Okay. Uh, the other items listed there, we have the IRS mileage rate for the 2018 school year went from 0 0.535 to 0 0.545 uh, for the 2018 school year. Um, we also have a gift grant and donations with two of them. Uh, that we'll request you to approve next week. Uh, and we will also request that you approve a uh, postage uh, machine lease agreement. Uh, our existing lease agreement is with Pitney Bowes. Uh, it is expiring on uh, February 28th. Uh, we've received uh, pricing from uh, several vendors, and we're recommending the award, uh, the, the new lease agreement to uh, EO Post. Uh, it's uh, the lowest. Uh, uh, price structure that we've received for these services. So there's an attachment uh, to the report for your review, um, but we'll ask your approval on that at next week's meeting also. Yeah, hey, what's the difference between somebody giving to the district versus giving to the foundation? The difference? You can do either or. Um, I'll just say that uh, running the foundation to 501c3 uh, tax purposes, I think it's People have more of a comfort level than the required one C3 and are more willing to do so. Um, but they can also get through the district if they get this similar tax breaks uh, by getting through the district. Thank you. Well, yeah. 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 Okay, that's uh, the question we've spoken about it, but that's very quickly. We received two um, gifts, grants, and donations. The DMJ has been very um, um, willing. They want, they want to give back to their to their customers. Um, so they asked us to put together a list of sort of wish list items that uh, we would like to uh, have implemented here within the district. Um, and it didn't necessarily have to revolve around uh, uh, transportation. Um, we do have a need for a baby grand piano. And I know there's going to be some, some level of fundraising for that baby grand piano. And uh, they were willing to sort of be our seed on the board. So we were, yeah, we were very happy with that. The other one that's noted on there is that uh, we had a, an anonymous uh, community member who, who was willing to donate um, towards, a, one of our delink, uh, towards one of our students' delinquent meals account. So we greatly appreciate that. We've had that happen before and we're hoping that you know, maybe people recognize that that's an option and they have a willingness to do so. We, we, we definitely would be uh, happy to, to accept and, and be very grateful. So it was a fun our finance meeting was this evening at 5, and uh, our next finance meeting will be Tuesday, February 13th at 5 p.m. You know, to see us.
facilities operation planning. Uh, we have a presentation from our friends, Nick and George. Some of the anticipated work that's coming up. We've got uh, the roof 
will continue. Uh, obviously, we're getting days here and there where we can't work on the roof, and sometimes it's more days than when we can. It uh, doesn't stop the guys from being inside doing all of the work that they can to make it ready for when we start the drywall to be out of the way and the guys who are doing the drywall can just keep moving. This area on the right is the, uh, this, this area right on the right here is the hallway outside of the cafeteria and the gym. Uh, it was poor during the, the last month. And we're anticipating pouring some more of that. The bottom level here will be poured by next Wednesday uh, with the good break in weather that we're going to have here over the next week or so. So, so it's one of the few remaining areas where the concrete floor is not poured again. So that, that's another piece to another milestone. And you can see on the top that that was all tented in where the uh, masons were working behind it. Every day they go inside there with heaters uh, to maintain a certain temperature so that the block and the brickwork set up properly. <coughs> they keep the <coughs> they keep the tent up until a couple of days after it's washed down so it has time to kind of dry out, not exposed to the to the temperature changes of the exterior. It, it's kind of a neat process because you, you, you don't really see all the work happening because it's covered with plastic, but then one day an entire side of the plastic comes off the building and you're like, wow, there's a building that we're doing something. <laughs> this is our submittal process. We've had over 488 uh, submittals for choosing the specific items that are going into your building. Hank gets those and has been turning around in very good time. Uh, no, no contractor will be able to claim that he was delayed because he didn't have a, a quick approval on a submittal, which is critical, as it is with the RFIs in the next slide. You can see we had a flurry of RFIs. Now the number, all, R, all closed RFIs and all the RFIs, 250 or 60 of those were in the pre-bid process. We continue the number over. This program uh, allows you to continue all the RFIs from the very beginning of the actual bid process through the end of the project. And they're becoming less and less every day. Uh, now it's more fine-tuned uh, RFIs, trying to get it down to things that you know, fit here and there within inches of each other. It's, it's and a lot of times the, the RFIs at this point are being used to document things that were discussed. Because a contractor has a pretty innocuous question about something that's, that's currently on the documents and to show them where it is and whatnot, but then there's an RFI generated that says this is the question, this is how it was answered, so that it's documented. And then there's the brick on the, on the top. No, I'm sorry, that's the, uh, the masonry at the uh, gym area. You can see the high bay windows. Those will be the tree lit translucent panel that'll fit right under the, the roof line there. It's good. That's gonna, it's really gonna look good. And on the left, you can see one of the large stair towers that's installed now so that we can get between floor levels. Another one's coming next week. So we should have another one of those in within a week or so. This was a, a big, Step, you know, having there, but, uh, <laughs> the contractors get up and down that out of these matters. So. Yeah. And visitors to the site. <laughs> Let's see what's next. On here is uh, the financial statement. I'm sure it's showing up clearer on your computer screen if you've got that up. Uh, the red numbers are obviously uh, credit change orders. Uh, right now we're around $112,000 in credit change orders. Uh, so we've maintained 
good stewardship of your money so far, and we plan to uh, keep it that way. Uh, haven't had a lot of, of change orders. We're going to have some next month that are going to be uh, taken away from that credit. There's going to be a few that we have to, to pay the contractors instead of taking it back, but it's about time. We didn't think we would make it through the entire job with credit change orders. <laughs> We're going to keep those to a minimum, keep moving towards the end of the project. And that's the slide. If anybody right. has any questions, you know we're welcome to talk about it. We both share a passion for this stuff. Anybody? It looks awesome. Oh, it's the public office is going to be there. No, I'm just going to The contractors are doing a good job of working with the community. The community is going to be chipping away at it. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Our facilities operations and planning committees are on task. Uh, we are meeting on January 8th. Uh, facilities operations and planning committee meetings will be Thursday, February 8th at 3.30 p.m. at the administrative Student activities and recreation.
because it is out of sequence, because it's the position on the Senate, the Senate position. So I just wanted to assure the board that um, we will be following through, as we always do, um, with having our high school students, if they're interested in registering, so giving them that opportunity. Just a correction, Mrs. Schneider, is that, is that House is it oh, sorry. Congressional oh, sorry. position yes, yes. of former Congressman <coughs> So you look at me and I thought, please. March date in awesome. and I know that the student has to have turned 18, I think, on the day before. So obviously we don't require students to register to vote, but we give them the opportunity to. Thank you for the question. Anything else? Yes, no problem. Thank you, Mrs. Slider. Meetings adjourned.